Jim, uh, you come from a family of lawyers. Uh, what drew you to the law and what drew you to criminal law? When I was younger, I always used to think the power of the state was pretty severe. I'd see what impact it had on everyday citizens. I thought, you know, it seems unreasonable that no one there to stand up for those people. So my father, who was a great believer in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, always would say, this is an area of the law that people need to know about and they need to know their rights. And from my point of view, I always thought that was an important piece to remember. And like I say, in society, it, people are inherently good. There are examples where they're said not to be good. I think someone has to put that to the court and let the court decide in the best light possible that person. Must be difficult though. I mean, uh, defense work is pretty thankless. You don't win a lot because you, the odds are stacked against you. Um, you try your best, but uh, can it get uh, demoral demoralizing at times? I always like to say the example of sitting in a courtroom uh, with uh, the gallery filled with friends of the friends and relatives of the deceased, and they want justice. So when uh, one of my senior colleagues likes to say the lonely, li lonely life of defense counsel, it, comes to, it really comes to bear in that situation. So I think about that, but then I try to remember, I'm not the person who's on trial. So if I have feelings that I'm being hard done by or my life is difficult, I look across the way to my client and I realize he's the person that this is all about and he's the person who's probably suffering this way worse than I am. So you, you kind of develop a kinship, it's sort of the two of you against the world almost? You know, you think that too, but I always have to remember to be objective about it and remind myself that I'm there to do a job. And it, it's a very, very specific job, but you do, have, you do have some commonality with your client because the two of you are inescapable in terms of the public's perception of what you do, and of course they're going to say your lawyer is your client and vice versa, no matter what. So looking back, uh, you've had a pretty distinguished career. Can you think of uh, a case or two that really stands out as being rewarding or legally interesting? Oh, sure. There's So one of the earlier homicides I did in my career uh, was a case of an abused spouse out of Strathmore, Alberta. And this is a case where the evidence seemed overwhelming when we started. But when you dug deeper and read the circumstances of how these two parties got along, the abuse was terrible. And as it goes, if you think about it, this person didn't deserve that, that particular relationship. And when she decided that she had enough, you know, the law was there to protect her. And that was a really good example of how the jury saw things the way I think they should have seen them. So another one is a case that uh, Elias Sanders and I did together, and that was a gentleman who was charged with running an underage trick pad. In fact, a bunch of them in the northeast of Calgary. The Crown and the uh, police announced 75 counts involving underage sex with minors. The fellow said, I didn't do any of this stuff. I had nothing to do with this. So after the case started, the Crown pared the charges down to about nine, and he was then ultimately acquitted of everything except a count of common assault for his, the person who was his then girlfriend. So that was really rewarding because there's a really good example of how the might of the state comes to bear against one person, and it takes someone to say, no, that's not right. Someone to say, no, my client's innocent, and prove it. Now, uh, people have a perception of, of trials and courtrooms, of glamorous TV shows that they see, you know, everything's done in a, an instant, and uh, they don't really realize the, the work that has to go into a trial. Can you uh, elaborate on what you have to do to get prepared for a case? Sure, if it was only as easy as watching television, seeing that one pad of paper and the pen on the desk, I wish it was that easy. So for every hour you spend in court, you're probably putting 10 or 20 hours of prep work into it. And those requires hours and hours of reading, working with other people who uh, do research work for you, other people who will uh, you work together to prep the witnesses, prep the law. So that's, I'd say, in any example of any Queen's Bench jury case, you're putting 10 to 20 hours in per hour you're in court. And the same is true for provincial court trials. The preparation is the same, about the same level, because you have to know the case better than the Crown, and you have to know the case better than the judge. And you have to be able to present that to the court. One, one thing I often hear lawyers talk about is uh, disclosure, and, and it often comes with the adjective voluminous. <laughs> um, can you explain exactly what you, know, you have to go through to get through the case and, and understand what your client's up against? Oh, yeah. So, what ha so in, the days, in the days when I started, we get files from the Crown that came in paper form of disclosure, be maybe half an inch thick. Now we get it in hard drives. And those have to be organized and put into file folders that are coherent in terms of 
um, how you're going to use this and how to access it. So you're taking all that information, putting it either printing it as some people do, or you're organizing within within a computer database so you can access it. That is one of the hardest jobs to do because you need to know what's important and what isn't important. If you don't know what that is, how can you defend your client? But certainly it takes time to get that done, and that is one of the hardest things any lawyer has to do. You ever get cases that just you find demoralizing that uh, no matter how hard you try, you just can't figure out a way to, to get around the grounds case? I get puzzled by cases from time to time, and so I always say if I don't have the answer, then I look to some of my colleagues and bounce it off them. The defense bar is great for that, so I'll ask someone uh, who might have a different perspective on it. But like I say, any case always presents the same challenges. You have to pit, work away piece by piece at it and get to a point. You, can't, you sometimes can't see the big case. You have to work at the evidence, work through the evidence, and then at that point in time you have a better understanding of it. But demoralizing, sure, there's many times I look at the case and say, wow, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I suppose there's also the fact that uh, sometimes uh, a former client will walk back through the door and, and be back at it again. That must uh, kind of hurt. Sometimes you ask yourself, I just spent all this time cleaning up the world, look at the mess it's in now. But yes, that does happen, but it's the nature, it's human nature. Some people just don't have the same fortunate set of circumstances that other people do, and you have to accept it. Take them who they are, take them as they are. I, I assume that uh, the majority of your clients would be in the category of the downtrodden, people who uh, haven't really been dealt a, a great lot in life. Yeah, I think, I think to talk about the marginalized individual, I think is a really, really fair comment. And we think about things that we take for granted are things that our clients sometimes just don't have. And that manifests itself, and ultimately those problems compound when they're faced with certain choices and certain challenges, things that, deficiencies that we don't have in our life. So those add to the complexity of the decision-making process that they're engaged in. And within that construct of decision-making, you have examples of people who just make the wrong decision. Not because they're bad or because they shouldn't do it, just because that's what they know. And how do you deal with people who say, oh, you're a defense lawyer, you're just uh, defending guilty people and, and trying to get bad people back out on the street? What do you say to those people? I would say, if you had a son or a daughter or a relative who was in trouble, I'm the person you want helping you. So imagine yourself, I'm the only person between that person and going to jail. So when you think about that, my rule becomes very, very clear and it always helps to personalize it by saying, if this was your family member or friend, you'd want someone doing the same thing for you. I think it's part of uh, defense work is uh, knowing your enemy. Uh, do you do a lot of uh, sort of studying, not only the, the prosecutors you're up against, but the judges you're going to go against or go a for? Absolutely. A good lawyer knows the law, a great lawyer knows the judge. Absolutely. And the Crown Prosecutor's Office is the same way. You're talking about a skilled group of criminal lawyers who all they do is work on criminal matters all the time. So you're talking about some very, very good litigants, excellent criminal lawyers, some of, some of whom I've known since they started and some of whom I hope I don't have to see too many times in court because it is a challenge because they are very, very good at what they do. And people forget that and sometimes in the, we all are influenced by television thinking it's an us versus them. The truth of the matter is you actually know more about your Crown Prosecutor, the person across the, across the way from you, than you might know about your own colleague and you do that for a reason because you know what they think of things. You know how they look at things, and you know how they're going to attack a case. And believe me, they come prepared, and they come ready to go. So you better be the same. Yeah, in, in courtroom decorum, you always refer to the other side as your friend, but it's more like with friends like those. <laughs> who, needs, who needs enemies? I, I, think, I think that could be the same for both sides. I think some would say that about me as well. In fact, I think one of the Crown prosecutors would say to me, you should really retire so you can be someone else's problem for a while. But we all do it in the same sense that we're there to cooperate, we're all officers of the court, and we're there to do a job. But you're talking about um, litigating with a professional group of litigators who this is all they do, and they're very good at it. So you better be sure that you're up to the challenge. If not, you shouldn't be stepping in the courtroom. And have you ever thought of uh, just turning your back on criminal law, maybe going into something that pays better and doesn't have to deal with uh, the, the marginalized people in life? No, because I think you'd be letting them down. And my skill set's so small, I don't think I could do anything else. No, I mean, as, as marginalized as it is, you can't let those people down. And someone's got to be there to look out for them. And if you're there for your clients, that means you're there because you believe that justice should be done. You believe that people should have the right to be represented with 
a case that's complex or a case that where it seems overwhelming. That's what you want to be able to do. At the end of the day, you don't always win every case, as you said at the beginning, and that happens. But as long as you've done everything you can to put everything from your client's best evidence to the court, then you've done what you should do. And I guess that uh, because there are so many different criminal offenses, you do get such great variety in what you do that it, it always may, remains interesting for you. Absolutely. Each case is different, and what makes it really different for me is the people. That's what makes criminal law so great, because you're helping people, and you're helping lots of different people from every possible background, every walk of life, every country, every, every possible variation you could think of, you're helping them. And that's, I re that's the part of my job I really love. I'd really miss the people. Okay, what do you do with the client who walks in here and you get the disclosure from the Crown and he's definitely nailed to the cross? How do you deal with that kind of client? Make the Crown prove it. Crown's got to prove lots of different pieces of evidence. Make him prove it. And if I've got nothing from my client, then I make the Crown prove the case. And I think there's always a hope of something. There's always different areas of the law that might enter into the picture that, that could create a defense even for the person sure. who seems dead in the water. Absolutely. The law requires proof of a number of the elements of the offense. It requires the Crown to prove all these things. Missing one of these things means the client gets acquitted, and that's what you need to remember.